now. So uh, uh, welcome to um, Therapeutic Modalities. Uh, my name is Tony Breitbach. Um, I'm director of the AT program. Um, I've been teaching this class for probably about um, eight to 10 years um, on and off. I've team taught it and, and taught it with a, we have a great group of um, lab instructors this year. So it's gonna work out great. Um, let's see, I'm gonna click here, okay. Okay, so our objectives for today are number one, we're gonna introduce the course. Um, we're gonna talk just generally about different types of therapeutic modalities, um, look at some of their basic effects, um, understand you know, the role of modalities in the plan of care, um, and then some different therapeutic applications and different terminology that we'll be using um, going forward in the course. So what are therapeutic modalities? And there's really, they, if you look them up in the dictionary, you will not see those two words together. Um, so what we need to do is we need to break it apart. So, so therapeutic um, pertains to something that has a medical or healing properties that um, are results of a treatment or a healing agent um, in Tabor's Cyclopedic Dictionary. A modality is a method of application of, a, of any therapeutic agent. So, so a modality could be like a pill, for example. A modality could be your hands. A modality could be anything. But, but um, when we talk about it in, in, in athletic training and physical therapy, we really think of more of like physical agents, devices, those types of things like that. So, so a modality is any specific sensory stimulus such as taste, touch, vision, pressure, or hearing. So when we put it all together, it's a device or technique that delivers a physical agent to the body for therapeutic purposes. So actually this picture here is of, of Bob Bowman, who's a graduate of the SLU PT program, who was a longtime athletic trainer at SLU um, in the basement of West Pine Gym, working hard. Um, so to fully understand the role of therapeutic modalities, you must um, understand the overall rehabilitation process. Therapeutic modalities are are a tool, they are not a means to an end. So if someone goes in um, to get a treatment and all they do is get stim and ice or, or an ultrasound treatment, they're, they are not getting the full benefit of the, of the knowledge of the clinician that's taking care of them. Um, you need to understand how the modalities fit in this process. So one of the things that any of you that have worked um, as a work study student, for example, in athletics, or if you worked as a, an aide in a, in a um, a PT clinic, um, you are a knobologist, right? You go to the machine, you say the physical therapist or the athletic trainer tells you, okay, if this person comes here, press this knob, press this knob, do five minutes, keep the ultrasound head moving, you, you're, you're good to go. But what we want you to do in this course is we want you to understand, we want you to understand why we do this treatment and how, why you would choose one treatment over the other. <clears throat> and and when you're a knobologist, you, you, it's a study of an application without science. The other thing, the total goal of this class is to really have you in this class to be able to apply therapeutic modalities appropriately and safely. Um, this is not, we're not out to trick you. We're not out to, um, we're not going to be giving you gotcha questions, any of those types of things like that. Our duty, our duty to you and to our professions is to really have you leave this class to be able to apply these therapeutic modalities safely and accurately. So what we, what we do is we give you a systems approach. Um, so we, we're going to give you a, a set system of, of steps that you'll use for every single modality as you apply them, and we will apply them in that way every single time. Um, you must uh, match the proper therapeutic modalities with your therapeutic goals, and you need to assess those therapeutic goals. So, um, so that's one of the things that's important. And this all fits in as a part of the, the evidence-based practice framework. Okay, so one of the things that you'll hear a lot in medicine and therapy, you'll hear, well, therapeutic modalities don't work. Okay, the reality is, is this. There's three levels to therapeutic of evidence-based practice. There's number one, it's the best available evidence in the literature. Number two, it's the patient values and experiences, what the patients feel and what they perceive to be beneficial. And the third one is your own clinician expertise. The one thing about best available evidence is this, is that the best evidence really is built around 
the whole issue of randomized controlled trials. And what do randomized controlled trials mean? Randomized controlled trials mean that both the, the investigator and the subject are blinded to whether or not they get the treatment. Think about things like cold. Think about things like heat. Think about things like stimulation. You cannot be blinded to that, right? Cold feels cold, hot feels hot. Stimulation makes you tingle, right? So the thing is, is you, you never can get really, really high level evidence a lot of times other than using laser or sham ultrasound or something like that. So as a result, the, the, there'll be a lot of people that say that there's not a lot of strong evidence, but, but people that, clinicians that use therapeutic modalities regularly, patients that have had it regularly perceive its uses. So, so one of the things that, you know, we, we do recognize that there is, there is not really high level evidence in certain areas, but what we try to do is we try to balance that evidence-based practice between all these types of things. Another thing about, about, you know, whether it be in athletic training or physical therapy, the reason why you, you may see therapeutic modalities used more often in athletic training is for one reason. In athletic training, we have more time. So as a result, you know, if someone's not practicing, they're still there. So like literally we have, we have hours of their time. Whereas a physical therapist, if the patient's not in the clinic, they're not in the clinic. If you have three, 30 minutes or 45 minutes with a patient, you're not going to do a 25 or 30 minute treatment with them. Um, you may ask them to do these treatments on their own at home or something like that. So that's another reason why you see some discrepancies between our professions on the way we utilize therapeutic modalities because because athletic trainers have a lot more time. They have their patients around for longer periods of time. So let's think about what, what, why do we use therapy modalities in rehabilitation? Number one, to, um, to reach a specific therapeutic effect. Decrease pain, increase range of motion, um, find ways to improve the tissue healing process, muscle recruitment, um, limiting atrophy. Um, you wanna utilize clinical decision-making, and make it part of your overall therapeutic intervention and part of a comprehensive plan. Oops, went backwards. Okay, um, one of the APTA has a pretty strong um, position statement um, regarding use of, of physical agents and modalities because there was some there was some misuse of modalities just to make money because they used to be able to bill for ultrasound and bill for um, you know, STEM and all those types of things like that. So as a result um, that they developed a po position statement that you only should be using physical agents and modalities as a part of a larger rehabilitation process that, in that involves movement and manual therapy and all those types of things like that. So, so um, and you need to have documentation to support that. So efficacy of modalities. Um, uh, we a lot of times they're rated for effect during the rehabilitation process. If they have a direct effect, that's a good choice. So for example, um, one of the reasons why we use cold is that it takes away pain, right? It decreases nerve conduction velocity. It decreases pain. That's a direct effect. Um, it's a, that's why it's a good choice for pain. Um, some, some are only effective if they're used in a specific way. Um, and that's a little less, less efficacious. And then some are somewhat effective, may not be the best choice, and you may want to look at other therapeutic modalities as you move forward. Also, um, you, you need to, uh, you know, think about what outcomes you're looking for. So do you have ways of measuring these outcomes? Um, is it the best measurement of, for each individual? Sometimes, uh, sometimes activities of daily living are important. Some people are very, uh, very uh, focused on enhancing performance. They want to, they want to be at performing at a very high level. To one person, be able to um, cook themselves dinner is very, very important. Another person wants to be able to break the world record in the 100 meters. So I think it's really, really important that we focus on the patient and what their, what their goals are as they go through that. You also got to understand the enigm enigmatic nature of pain. Pain is perceived, okay? Pain is not, pain is very difficult to measure. Um, and it's a, it, in, in we do have some decent validated scales that we use. We use a numerical pain scale, those types of things like that. Um, but it also is a perceived 
feeling. So um, that one of the things that always drove me crazy with coaches, they would say, well, he's got a low pain tolerance. I'm like, why does it matter? It's what they perceive. You know, your, your judgment of their pain tolerance is not that important. Um, and then the expected physiological effects we need to keep in mind. Um, once again, modalities are key complements to therapy. You studies and reviews, you need to really look at the context with which those are, those are done. Some are done in isolation, some are done more as a part of a larger process. Um, you, need to, you need to understand, you know, how can we improve their quality of life and functional ability and, and overall patient satisfaction. Once again, these are adjuncts to a larger therapy program. Here's some different types of therapeutic modalities. Thermal modalities. A thermal modality is, is any modality that, that delivers um, a sensation above absolute zero. So that means either cold or, um, or hot are both thermal or infrared modalities. And so as a result, um, and really what, what, what cold is, is the absence of heat. Okay, so heat is really the only, is, is, is the, what we measure. Um, areas, uh, heat moves from areas of, of to, to areas of less heat. So, so as a result, what cold is, is actually heat being removed from, from the area. Um, electromagnetic, electrotherapy, things like diathermy, ultraviolet, infrared light. And then there's mechanical, um, uh, mechanical traction, compression. Things like therapeutic ultrasound are kind of a combination of electromagnetic and mechanical. What that does is it, 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 it creates heat by, by delivering um, sound waves through tissue, which through, through that friction um, causes an increase in heat. Um, some of the reason therapeutic modalities, cold modalities, some of the reasons why we use cryotherapy. Um, there is a there is a uh, decrease of tissue metabolism, decreased blood flow, but it's not it's not appreciable. It's really the the main reason we use cold is to is to um, it it you you your pain perception decreases because nerve conduction velocity decreases. Types of things that we use, and we'll be talking about those a lot more next week: ice, cold water, cold packs, vapor coolant sprays, those types of things like that. Thermotherapy. It also decreases pain, but it decreases pain through sedation. It doesn't decrease pain through um, a decrease in nerve conduction velocity. It causes more re relaxation, those types of things. They have a tendency to have a slight increase in blood flow to the area and also helps with tissue extensibility. Um, submersion in warm water, hot packs, diathermy, ultrasound, those are all types of things that are heat modalities. Electrotherapy can be used a lot of different ways, and, 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 and we will go through the different ways that we do that. It can decrease pain. It can have a, an impact on the, uh, of accumulated edema. It can also um, be used to either cause a contraction to strengthen or relax muscles, depending on how we use it. Um, if someone is in a situation post-surgically where they have atrophy or they have um, um, or they're in a, or they're post-stroke or one of those types of things like that, we'll utilize it for neuromuscular re-education. Um, we can impact wound healing, um, all those types of things like that. And some, some common acronyms you see are transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, which is TENS, neuromuscular electrical stimulation, um, uh, functional electrical stimulation and iontophoresis. Um, shortwave diathermy and inf infrared radiation are two things that we don't see very often in clinics, um, but they do exist and they will probably be on your board exams. So, um, so we will teach about them. Um, they cause, they utilize um, a radiation to uh, um, increase tissue temperature um, and, um, and and it usually, um, it, the, the, the machine is not in contact with the skin. It radiates the tissue below it and causes an increase in temperature of, the, of tissue with, with high water content. Different types of mechanical modalities are compression. They can be something as simple as wraps, stockings, garments, or, or compression pumps like Normatec. People have seen Normatec before, Game Ready. Those types of things um, are compression pumps. Uh, hopefully that one of the main reasons we do this is decrease edema. It also can have an impact on, on, on 
really, really severe injuries and with scar tissue modeling, those types of things. Also, um, compression wraps work very well with um, with um, amputation, um, with modeling of the, with remodeling of the stump um, in working with that. Traction um, can either be done manually or mechanically. And hopefully what we do with traction is decrease compression on structures, for example, with spinal traction. Um, we also use it in some areas of the extremities um, but really for the most part, most of the time we'll use it as either a surgical, cervical or lumbar traction. Um, <clears throat> this is a much younger version of me um, when I was a student at the University of Iowa. Um, so how do we select our therapeutic modality? Or does the physician select? Um, what factors influence your decision? You know, how does this relate to your therapeutic modality? goal. So one of the best things you can get is a order from a physician that says evaluate and treat, right? Um, you want to be able to make your own clinical decisions as a, as a health professional. Um, however, sometimes you don't. Some, some physicians will write out, do electrical stimulation for, you know, two weeks or something like that. Um, it just depends on, it depends on the, the relationship you have. Um, standing orders can be really helpful in these situations where you, um, um, you have a good relationship with your referring physician or, or your supervising physician, or some areas have direct access, which, which you're allowed to um, uh, make more independent decision making in those situations. Uh, so, so when we select modalities, we, we need number one, we need to understand our diagnosis. So your clinical skills, either that or you need some, you need a definitive diagnosis with a gold standard modality. Um, you need to have a, you need to understand what kind of changes happen um, with the injury. And then you need to understand what you want to try to accomplish by having a therapeutic goal. To be able to have, to meet the therapeutic goal, you need to understand the modalities effects, their indications and contraindications and match that goal. Match your therapeutic goal with the modality that helps you achieve that goal. So there's the shotgun approach um, where you basically try everything and hope that something work. So that's the old throw it against the wall and see if it sticks. Or there's the rifle approach. It's where you focus, you understand the, the, um, the uh, impact and uh, you, you focus your modality exactly on that. And especially this works much better when you're in a very time constrained situation. So focus of a modality application is number one, use modalities that target your specific therapeutic goals, the specific needs of the patient, that become a part of your overall rehabilitation plan and that are based in the evidence. So when we're gonna teach you in this course, I talked about this earlier, a general approach. So we're gonna have a five-step process that will, will be, can be applied across any modality. That way you can use your own knowledge, you can use your own understanding. If you come across a modality that maybe we didn't talk about in class or if you have available at your clinic, um, you can apply it that way. You're also, not, this is really, really helpful as you go through your practical exam, you're likely not to forget things because we will continue to keep bringing it up. So the, the five-step process is number one, you need to understand the foundation and background information. You need to understand the science behind um, whatever modality you're trying to use. You need to understand the steps you need to go to through pre-application. You need to understand how to safely apply it, the steps you need to go to post-application, and maintenance and how to maintain the equipment. Most of these things have equipment and they're fairly expensive. You need to understand how to manage that situation so you can continue to use it over and over and over again. So the foundation, we, we want to define what the modality is, um, how it operates, and what its effects are what kind of physiological, pathological changes, both locally and systemically. Systemically, that has a function of, of if there's precautions or contraindications or those types of things like that, that can be applied. So um, different types of examples of clinical applications of the therapeutic modality. So it could be modulation of pain. We have in physiology and exercise physiology, we've heard of the gate control theory, right? Um, how we um, flood the afferent neurons with, with, um, with sensation and hopefully um, kind of close that gate at the dorsal horn of the spinal cord of that sensation of pain that uh, people feel. We, alteration of skeletal muscle performance, increased strength, 
retrain the 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 um, retrain the the um, coordination, decrease spasticity of the muscle, um, decrease inflammation to facilitate tissue healing. If someone has a large ulcer, if someone has a lot of edema, those types of things like that, we're looking to help with that, and then increase tissue extensibility to promote flexibility and range of motion. Oops. Um, so, you know, when we think about the foundation is what, what are the advantages? What makes this modality more effective than other modalities in this situation? What are the disadvantages? What are the negative effects? Could there be side effects? Could there be, um, could it be an expensive modality, for example? Not every place has laser. Laser is a very effective modality, but there, you know, a laser is $10,000, $5,000, $10,000. Not every clinic chooses to get that. Also, you need to have a separate room to do laser in or, or um, because of the, you know, the possible eye damage that can occur with laser. So we'll talk about that. Indications, which, which are the modality can be used to help reach the goal and contraindications. Contraindications are, are, if, are, are there's an unacceptable risk of an adverse event or an adverse outcome that make it so you should not be using this modality. Um, it, it does more harm than good. It does not you know, especially in certain patient situations with certain conditions. An example of this is Raynaud's phenomenon, where, a, where, a, where a, someone has a hypersensitivity to cold, where their fingers go white and, and they change color. Um, you definitely do, you wanna avoid using cold in those situations. Precautions are situations where you need to be really careful. Um, you know, they, they might, be really light complected and you want to be really careful with a with a heat modality where they may burn easily. You need to be careful with those situations. Some common indications and contraindications of precautions that we may see if they have compromised impaired or diminished sensation um, or compromised impaired or diminished cognition or communication. So the, really the reality is in a modality where we rely on the patient, because remember pain is perception, right? Um, we rely on the patient's feedback on applying the modality. If they cannot feel the area or if they cannot perceive what's going on accurately, we're putting them in danger by, by administering a therapeutic modality on them. So we have to be really careful in those situations. Um, if someone has electronic implants like pacemakers, defibrillators, phrenic nerve stabilators, or pain pumps, you have to be really careful. Pregnancy is, is there's especially anything on the torso, pregnancy can be a major, um, a major issue. Do not, you do not want to harm that fetus. And then if they have presence of cancer, a lot of these therapeutic modalities rev up your metabolism. Do we want, if, if, if cancer cells are, are, are spreading all over a person's body, do we want to rev up the metabolism? Probably not, you know, so we want to, we want to know that that's going on. So the pre-application stage has a bunch of different types of tasks. So setting the stage, selecting the proper modality, preparing the patient physically, preparing the patient mentally, and preparing the equipment. Setting the stage. This is gonna be consistent across almost all of our courses, right? The first thing I always tell people, and especially in this time, is wash your hands in front of your patient. The reason being is that that shows your respect for them. Okay, if 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 they walk, if a doctor walks into your into your exam room, and and touches you immediately, you're like, where were those hands? What did what condition did that person just have that you just examined, right? But if you stop, and it's a great way to start conversation. You get the get the get the san hand sanitizer, put it in your hand. Hey, how's it going? Hi, my name is Tony. I'm your I'm your athletic trainer for um, that's going to be working with you today. You can. That's a great way to, to show the patient you have respect for them and also just maintain appropriate hygiene. Introduce yourself and your role. You need to verify the identity of the patient, um, especially if it's a new patient. You need to say what's your, you know, what's your full name and identify maybe the date of birth or your address or something like that. You do, you do not want to be treating the, the wrong John Smith or Jane Doe or something like that. You want to make sure you're treating the right person. Um, you want to ask them what's their chief complaint, right? What's their reason why they came in? So what's bothering you today? 
those types of things like that. And then you want to request consent to treat and continue. So is, is it okay if we, we move forward with our treatment? Um, all of those things have to be a part of that initial setting the stage. And I do know that in other courses, you're using the, those criteria also. Um, selecting the proper modality. We need to think about the, the foundation and we need to make sure that we are um, selecting the appropriate modality. Um, we reevaluate the condition, review if they had a previous treatment, if, that, if it worked the last time, we would do that. Um, and we want to establish the objectives and goals of the therapy, okay? And so we, then we match the therapeutic goal with the modality. We want to consider all those types of things. And we always want to verify contraindications verbally with the patient. So even though they may have in their medical record that they do not have Raynaud's phenomena, we need to ask them, we're going to be administering cold to you today. D do you have a problem with hypersensitivity to cold? You need to ask them, right? Who knows who filled out that form, right? You need to ask the patient directly so that they realize that you're paying attention to those things and you're keeping them safe, okay? Um, we want to uh, prepare the patient physically. We want to, you know, remove any bandages or clothing, but we, all, we do not want to have them, you know, you know for example, a, 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 tra a, a female track athlete is, is probably just fine with a sports bra and spandex on a, a treatment table, but, you know, my my uh, grandmother probably is not. So you need to make sure that you drape people appropriately and you think about patient privacy and all those types of things like that. And you also realize that um, preparing the patient physically, most treatments take 15, 20 to 30 minutes. You wanna make sure that they're positioned appropriately on um, that they can stay in that position for, the, for quite a long time, okay? Um, Preparing the patient psychological. Explain what you're going to do. Um, if you, you need to review the physiology, tell the patient what to expect, what to feel. Um, you want to demonstrate it on yourself if they're apprehensive. So sometimes you'll you'll stick your finger in the paraffin bath or or something like that, and then um, warn about any precautions. So okay, so if it starts feeling like it's burning, you you tell me because because we're going to get it taken, we're going to get you taken care of right away. Um, another thing you want to do is you, during this time, is you want to do your pre-assessment of your, of your outcome. So you, if you're, if you're, um, if you, your goal is to decrease pain, you'll ask them some sort of pre-testing of your outcome. So you'll be on a, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the, the worst pain you've ever felt in your life and zero being no pain. What is your pain level at? right now. Um, you may have to measure, measure range of motion with a goniometer. You might have to measure girth um, with, with a tape measure or, or something like that. Those types of things like that. You also, um, you want to warn about uh, different precautions. Um, uh, you do the setup. We also want to check the equipment operation, make sure the equipment is positioned appropriately and, it, and, it, uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's operating safely. So then we get to that, that application. We want to initiate treatments. We want to set the parameters. We want to monitor patient response and adjust the treatment. So the treat, main treatment parameters that we utilize when we administer a modality are in, their intensity or dosage. So that, think of that as, a, as the volume on your, on the, the intensity is like the volume on your radio and the dosage is the radio station, right? That's a, that's a wavelength. That's, the, that's your dosage level. The intensity is how high you turn it up. And so that, that's an easy way to remember kind of the difference between intensity and dosage. And then duration of treatment, how long you'll do the treatment, and how often you'll get the treatment. You know, some, some treatments can be done for unlimited periods of time. Some lose their effectiveness after a certain period of time, or some cause adverse effects after a certain period of time. So you need to understand those situations. You need to understand the appropriate adjustment sequence. So how do you turn it up? Um, also, can you allow the patient to turn it up some more if they don't, don't feel the um, treatment anymore? For example, um, the picture in here is a TENS unit. Often what we'll do is we'll set it initially, we'll instruct the patient in its use, and they will continue to turn it up as they accommodate to that sensation. And then you want to keep checking back with the patient's response. 
And you also want to give the patient a, a safety bell for them to be able to summon you whenever they need um, they they need you to come you know even if a, even if something has a safety switch that turns the machine off you still want to give them a safety bell the reason is is they may not want to turn the treatment off but they might want to get your attention so that you want to be able to give them that ability to get your attention or to turn a treatment off or something like that something like an ice bag or a hot pack they can just tell them to throw it on the floor don't you know don't let it burn you just if it's burning you throw it on the floor Post-application tasks, um, you want to remove the equipment, clean the area, um, post-treatment assessment, give some instructions to the patient and document, document, document. Um, instructions to the patient, um, you, want to, you want to tell them what they'll feel after treatment. Many times a the treatment, they'll be more sore later. Okay, because we're doing something with this area. So you want to tell them that. You want to tell them what they can do for self-treatment. Maybe you can take some over-the-counter medicine. Maybe you can um, uh, apply another ice treatment later. Those types of things like that. And set up follow-up appointments. Very few times is, 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 a, is someone getting treated in isolation, right, with a single treatment. Usually they'll, they'll be on a part of a treatment plan of some sort. Okay. You also want to... Um, uh, do any do any assessment post assessment in these situations like that. You want to document in a manner that another clinician can replicate your treatment. So you need to make sure you write the parameters down, the intensity down, the duration of the treatment, their setup, how they were positioned. All of those types of things need to be documented so that somebody who picks up your chart or looks at the electronic health record can can. Um, um, uh, replicate the treatment and you want to record your post-treatment assessment. So if you if you tested pain before, you want to test pain after. You want to really determine the efficacy of your treatment. You just don't want to be doing it to do it. Maintenance, you want to clean your equipment regularly. You want to do routine maintenance. You want to do simple repairs. Um, you know, this, uh, especially when, when we have electricity going through things, you don't want to be using worn electrodes, those types of things like that, or lead wires and those types of things. Okay, so one of the things we're doing is we are doing a poll right now. So I'm in the chat, I'm going to put this link. You can click on it there. You can also access it in Blackboard. This is the inflammatory process. So, okay, I'm going to go to the last slide here. So. The last slide um, is summarizing our presentation. Uh, we have def definitely different modalities to choose from. You need to have a sound rationale for your choices. You always need to consider things like indications, contraindications, precautions, and patient preferences, which is a key part of the evidence-based practice um, approach. And then you need to always be assessing the effectiveness of the modality. You need to have, you need to be testing your outcomes. You need to be assessing your patient, those types of things. Knowing that not every patient's going to respond the same to every single modality. So you need to have an individualistic approach. So, well, um, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you on lab this week. And um, if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to email me um, or um, those types of things. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Take care.